Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome uh, to the event, Four Years of Welcoming Resettled Refugees, Reflections on the UK's Community Sponsorship Scheme. We'd like to thank um, the wider Society from Your Sofa Festival for their support in organising this event. And it's all part of the annual ESRC Festival of Social Sciences, which of course is all online this year and showcases um, how pioneering social, economic and political research impacts on everyday life. In this event, our audience um, will be able to write questions um, to our panelists as the event progresses. Louise, is everything running according to plan? Yes, sorry, I'm just going to put that slide back up one moment. Good, I had a technical problem slide up here. Um, so we'll be doing a number of presentations and as those presentations progress, you can actually ask your questions as they come into your mind. Um, so what you'll see on your screen is a question and answer option in the panel. You type in your question and then you click send. So you can do this any time you like. Um, and what we'll do after we run the first panel is um, we'll select a number of, of questions. If your question isn't asked, um, you can still um, ask it directly of the person that you wanted to respond to you um, via email. Um, so they will get back to you. Um, please do not use the chat box. I know a lot of us are used to using the chat box for Q&A, but please don't do that. So um, this first panel, the, the event is divided into two with a whole five minute break in the middle, which hopefully you'll all make the most of. Um, I'm going to start the panel uh, with a brief presentation. I led the community sponsorship evaluation um, for, the, for, for, for the UK, it's an independent evaluation. So I'll talk a little bit about that first. Then I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Monica Kruzman, who's one of the co-directors of Reset. Our third panelist will be Paul Kenny, Kelly sorry, from a community sponsorship group in Settle. And then we're gonna finish this panel with a lovely film from Lena Alasmi, whose family has been sponsored by a community sponsorship group in the UK. We're gonna be quite tough on timekeeping. So we've got um, Sarah Hassan in the background doing timekeeping. She'll let you know when you have a minute to go, but also there'll be, yes, there's a big number one there. Um, and there'll also be a little noise that you'll hear. Um, can you make the noise, Sarah, now? Uh, that will let you know your time is, you've got one minute to go. After that, I'm afraid you get cut off. Um, when you are, oh, a little bit louder, I think, Sarah. Um, when you are um, answering your questions, once we get to the question and answer session, we ask you to keep your answers very short, please. Okay, on that note then, I am going to um, talk you through a very brief account of the findings to our evaluation. Um, the slide just came up, which showed you the um, link to the evaluation reports. Um, so there are four reports, one international study and eight policy briefs. Um, there are um, photos, videos, blogs, and all kinds of materials there. And we've tried to make them as accessible as possible. So you're not talking academic articles um, that are rather dull and difficult to read. So please, if you're interested in community sponsorship, do have a look across those materials. Um, the evaluation was funded by the University of Birmingham, but then by the Economic and Social Research Council and um, UK um, Research. So um, initially we were asked to do this by the Methodist Church and Citizens UK um, on a very small basis in the West Midlands, but it grew and eventually we interviewed um, 145 volunteers in 22 groups plus 12 thought leaders, so the kind of people who've been there from the beginning encouraging everyone to get involved in community sponsorship and forming the programme. 61 refugees who were all interviewed in Arabic, many by Sarah Hassan who's with us today, and 32 uh, members of the wider community in less diverse areas. Uh, the evaluation ran from 2017 to 2020. 
Um, we asked about application experiences, we asked about arrival processes, about expectations, motivations, experiences. We looked at how volunteers work together. Um, we looked, um, we spoke to refugees about their lives and about their integration journeys and much, much more. Um, as I said, the link is available for you, but you can always just Google Community Sponsorship Birmingham, which is I, what I do because I can never find the link and you can always find it that way. So what did we find? Um, and as I say, very brief overview. Uh, when we looked at the application process in the early stages in 2017, the processes were really frustrating and bureaucratic, but over time, these have radically improved. Um, volunteers have had a better sense of what was expected and the kind of timeframes involved. And of course, Reset started and was there to provide support with the application process, which just wasn't available at the beginning. There were also, in the early stages, very big frustrations around housing, how to find it, how to sustain it, and how to cover the costs while you're waiting for a Home Office decision, and how to find the right education when you didn't know the ages of the children you'd be supporting. Some of those are still around, but there's been a lot of learning and things have definitely improved. And again, support um, is now available from Reset and groups have started supporting each other, setting up informal networks. We found that most groups um, developed a kind of hierarchical structure with a core group, um, the group leaders who set things up, and then devolving around specialisms such as housing, education, language, and so on. And then supported by a wider group of generalist volunteers who dropped in and out, helping out with things like offering lifts, support to go to the doctors and this kind of thing. The groups themselves varied um, across secular and faith-based groups. And they're all based across four countries in the UK now in rural, urban and suburban areas. Now, what we found is whilst community sponsorship volunteering wasn't for everyone, the vast majority of people said um, they ended up working more hours than they expected. Um, but at the same time, the majority of them said they were extremely positive about their experiences. And we had a number of people saying to us, this is the best thing that I've ever done. Um, for some people, it really transformed their lives. And that's not what they went into it for, but that was a happy um, outcome of getting involved in community sponsorship. Some of the main stresses um, I think you've muted yourself. There you go. Um, some of the main stresses related to the lack of knowledge about refugees culture, the lack of knowledge about where um, what kinds of um, experiences refugees had had, um, the length of time it took refugees to learn English and the extent of support needed and the, uh, the struggles uh, associated with getting um, refugees to access work. Um, we found also that sometimes volunteers or groups had a sense that they were doing something wrong because they didn't realise that refugee integration is challenging for everybody. So it wasn't that they were doing something wrong, it's actually a difficult task. From a refugee perspective, um, we were very fortunate to have Sara Hassan as our Arabic speaking researcher and um, a number of refugees told her that um, they were sharing information with her that they hadn't shared with their groups, partly because they were so aware of the amount of time and energy the groups put into supporting them, they didn't want to talk about any of the concerns that they had. Um, before the conflict, most people had very he happy, healthy lives embedded in close social networks, and many of them had witnessed multiple horrors. All of them pretty much had lost everything. Some had lost um, you know, a lot of loved ones, um, but they carried with them uh, their love for their family, their faith and their skills and experience and an enthusiasm to build a new life. They had very little knowledge about where they were going, what community sponsorship was, about their rights and entitlements uh, once in the UK, but also about UK law, which was a bit of a stress because they're always worried that they're going to break the law and possibly be deported. They didn't know what would be happening about um, family reunion, whether they would be able to see their families again, how they might travel to visit families. 
and whether or not they could be deported, um, which they could not. Um, some refugees made very good connections with volunteers who became like family, uh, but no matter how rich these relationships were, and they very much were in some instances, all welcome the opportunity to have Arabic speaking friends because it is such hard work spending your life speaking in a different language. Biggest problems experienced were the um, amount of time it takes to learn English and to get work. And the lack of progress really undermine self-esteem for men. Um, most refugees wanted to stay in the, uh, in the UK forever and all wanted to access citizenship. Just very briefly, in terms of the wider community effects, uh, many areas put up quite a lot of opposition in advance, but the community sponsor volunteers brokered the scheme quite widely, did lots of PR work and advocating. And once refugees arrived, people were either positive or indifferent. And there was a clear sign that community sponsorship had a potentially transformational effect in areas with very little experience of diversity. It was changing hearts and minds in a small way, but we need more research in that area. Okay, so on that note, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Dr. Monica Kruzman now from Reset, thank you. Brilliant, thanks so much, Jenny. That was a, a, a terrific intro. And hello everybody, it's really nice to be with you uh, today and great to have an opportunity to discuss this really important and really exciting research. It's something that at Reset, we've, uh, we've really benefited from Jenny's work uh, any number of times over the last few years. I'm conscious I have only a short time with you today, so I'll try to be uh, really efficient. But as Jenny said, if you have questions or would like to pick up on anything I say, I'm really happy to be in touch afterwards and I will certainly um, get back to you as quickly as I can on anything. Um, I am not quite sure who, who is with us, but I imagine that some of you I know and certainly many of you I, I don't. So let me just begin with a very brief introduction. My name's uh, Monica Kruzman. I am together with my colleague, Kate Brown, co-director of Reset Communities and Refugees. Uh, we're a charity and we work to build and develop sponsorship throughout the UK. Uh, and increasingly, actually, we're working internationally to support uh, uh, the common learning and uh, through sh sharing our experience and knowledge of best practice here in this country. A huge part of our work uh, in the day to day is about supporting groups and bringing groups, helping them through the sponsorship journey right from the point where they form a group through the application process, uh, the, the, the process of getting ready to welcome a family and then through the support for the family. So the actual the whole the whole of the sponsorship experience. Um, so our work is really varied uh, and it's um, uh, certainly interesting, if nothing else. Um, let me say my purpose today in particular is uh, to talk to you and give you an update as best I can on the current situation of sponsorship uh, in the UK and to share what we know at Reset about prospects and plans. Uh, no question, we live in strange and volatile times. You don't need me to tell you that uh, the COVID pandemic has fundamentally changed the way that we do resettlement in this country. Um, here in the UK, you would know, I'm sure, that arrivals uh, for resettlement stopped in March when we had the first lockdown, uh, and they have not yet restarted, although uh, we had some really interesting news earlier this week, which I will get back to in a, uh, in a few moments. But at the time when the lockdown started in March, we had about 450 refugees who'd been settled in uh, the UK through sponsorship, and we had uh, more lined up to arrive imminently. And I really mean imminently. So when the lockdown started, there was one group who was inside 48 hours of uh, being ready to welcome a family. So that was a pretty intense experience. Um, obviously when the lockdown happened, our work at Reset had to pivot really quickly to being uh, moving from what was essentially a face-to-face -face and in-person training and support approach to be very much delivered online. And the content of the work that we were doing shifted also to uh, reflect the the experiences and the situation that sponsorship groups and families were finding themselves in. We found that we were dealing with uh, three types of issues based largely on the stage of the journey that the groups and the families were at. So for groups who were in the forming and application stage, we had a lot of questions about timing. When is what should I still put in my application? When will flights restart? How long is this all going to take? Uh, you know, is it, is it worthwhile to go ahead? What should we do about, uh, about timing and preparation? The second type of issue we were dealing with was for those, fam for those groups who were about, about to welcome families. And, and the case I just mentioned of 
uh, the group who was literally about inside a day or so of welcoming a family, their questions were, or their issues really, were, were very much about concern for the family that they'd been waiting to welcome, so worrying about the well-being of that family in this incredibly stressful time. Uh, and there were lots of logistical questions about, well, what do I do with this house now? I have this house, it's ready to go. I don't know when there's going to be anyone to live with them. What shall I do? Should, do I have to keep paying rent? So there were lots of those kind of questions about how to sustain readiness. And then there were uh, the kind of issues that came up for groups and families who'd already uh, had families resettled in the UK. And those um, were about how do we do integration? How do we do support? in a situation of social distancing where we can't meet each other, we can't see each other, and as group members, we can't see each other. So how can we function as a group? So those are very much the kind of uh, issues and questions that we at Reset have been dealing with in the recent uh, months. And we've also um, continued to do some of the work that Jenny alluded to before, working on the scheme and the structure overall. So as Jenny said, we certainly are fully aware. We, we, it was uh, the application form, I think it would be fair to say, was. In, in some ways the bane of our lives in the first year or so of the program and we've worked really closely with the home office and with uh, other partners to do everything we can to um uh, to speed up to smooth to kind of make that process neater so we continue to work on those kind of things i think it's really really important to say that through this period we have been thrilled and humbled on a daily basis by the way that communities and groups have responded so in the same spirit of solidarity that so many of us saw our neighbours reaching out to each other and to people in their networks to look after each other, we saw so many people in our sponsorship groups and in the community sponsorship family continuing to work for refugees and continuing to look forward to a time uh, when, they can, when, when we can all welcome newcomer, newcomers again, and that was brilliant. Uh, in the first half of this year, reflecting that, we had uh, a record number of applications to sponsor over a three month period, um, which was which was completely brilliant. And I think there are a few different factors behind that, partly because with some people, you know, having more time uh, to, to focus on going, going through the application and doing the process. But I think there was definitely a feeling of renewed urgency and commitment to the needs of, of the refugee families that, that we all want so much to help. Uh, it's also really important to say that we had, we've had a lot of new groups form, which was not something that we looked for necessarily anticipated. Through October, we had uh, four new groups forming. So four new groups inside a month is actually, is actually you know, really quite remarkable. The top three areas for sponsorship in the UK continue to be, as they have for a while, continue to be London, uh, the Southwest and Wales. But things are moving really quickly in other areas and in the southeast, actually, uh, we, we're seeing a lot of we're seeing a real surge of activity. So uh, well done and congratulations to everyone who's working in the southeast. Uh, it's really it's making a difference. It's really brilliant. I do want to flag that we, we really know uh, at Reset that this growth and the sustaining of the momentum has definitely been a product of collective effort and collaboration, not only between those of us who are working on sponsorship, but collaboration with the broader resettlement sector. And I think it's really important for all of us to remember that successful sponsorship exists as a part of a successful, sustained, broader policy uh, resettlement policy landscape in the UK. So it is part of a bigger picture. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, in terms of next steps and what the future holds, we have been heartened at Reset by the government's announcement on Monday this week that uh, flights bringing refugees to the UK will restart as soon as possible in order that the government can meet its commitment under the VPRS programme. So that's the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme. And that commitment uh, was the one to bring 20,000 people displaced by the Syrian conflict to the UK uh, by the end of this year, but which is to say by the end of March 2021. Uh, when the lockdown happened last spring. We had about 230 people remaining to be welcomed to meet that target for, 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 for government. So, so this news uh, is, is really positive, but it is essentially it's about finishing that process. It's about completing the commitment under the VPRS scheme. Uh, it's all really recent. We don't have all the details, but what we do know is that people who arrive uh, under this opening uh, of, of the uh, reopening of the, the arrivals process will be settled partly through local authority resettlement and partly through community sponsorship. Um, we know that the arrivals are likely to happen in the very early part uh, of next year, but it does depend a little bit on readiness 
Um, as I said before, when the lockdown happened, we had groups who were about to welcome a family who had houses ready, but they've now had to look at whether they can sustain holding holding accommodation for for this length of time for you know six uh, six or more months. So, so there's a lot to work through to reassess readiness. And for reset, uh, one of the things that we are going to be doing uh, imminently and urgently is to retrain all of the groups who will be welcoming in January February time next year, um, because there's there's a lot to refresh. There's a lot to refresh, not least about conditions around arrival and quarantine and the, the guidance from Public Health England on, on what resettlement will be, you know, what the practicalities of resettlement will be. Uh, it's really important to say that we are really conscious that while this is a really good news announcement, it's not... One minute. Oh, one minute. It's okay. I'm, I'm nearly there, Sarah. Uh, it is not a commitment to uh, a resettlement scheme beyond completion of the VPRS. And that's something we all still need to work towards and keep asking for. Um, on that front, it's worth saying that, um, you know, we are optimistic at Reset. We have seen good messages from government in recent weeks. We saw Public uh, Minister Philp, uh, Philp go on the record uh, explaining or expressing his understanding that sponsorship is, is important to UK communities. So that was great. Um, but we know that there are some big questions at the moment about the public health situation. We know that there are... Uh, concerns in government uh, about other parts of the resettlement landscape where they touch particularly on asylum uh, and it's no secret to anyone that, that there has been a comprehensive review of spending going on for quite some time and that uh, the outcomes of that review we, we would expect them possibly to have implications for resettlement policy as, as they would for anything else. So there are a, a number of quite complex dynamics going on and um, so, you know, while, while this announcement this week is brilliant and we really, uh, we really appreciate it and celebrate it, uh, we, it's, it's, uh, it's not the end of the story and there's still quite a lot, lot we need to do in terms of securing the future uh, of sponsorship. So let me, um, let me just leave it there for today. Uh, and as I said, I'm really happy to take questions or connect with you all later. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be with you. And thanks all so much for your, uh, your time and thoughts. Hi, thank you for that. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Paul Kelly, and I'm speaking to you from Settle in the North Yorkshire. Settle's often referred to as the gateway to the Dales. It's pretty famous for its famous scenic Settle Carlisle Railway, which is just part of the normal service network, um, but often has steam specials and things, so many people will know it. And if you're a fan of All Creatures Great and Small, the latest film version that's been on TV has all been shot in the villages and dales just around here, and it gives you a sense of, of what what it's like in this environment. Settle itself, it's a small market town, about two and a half thousand people live here, probably three times that number in the surrounding dales and villages very scattered. We've got an incredibly strong community spirit, but it's a town that isn't at all used and familiar to ethnic diversity. We don't have a college of further education. Um, as a result, we've had to provide the ESOL in-house and, and our volunteer team is, is really quite large. It's about 35 people. Uh, many of them, by no means all, come from different local churches, lots of people from diverse parts of our community. And we, our teaching team alone, the ESOL teaching team, is, is 15 people strong. I've been asked to talk to you specifically about uh, interpreters and particularly when they have a role as a befriender. I'm hoping there'll be a couple of minutes at the end where I can just tell you some other highlights here from, from Settle. But thinking about interpreters, two of our big challenges in, in a place like this, which is a highly desirable place to live, is that it was really hard to find affordable housing, but equally hard to find interpreters in a place where there's very little ethnic diversity. We research commercial options so that we've got them as a fallback. Because of our rurality, virtually everything we would have been able to um, uh, buy in would have been video telephone, something very unfamiliar to us two years ago, familiar now, but great to have them as a fallback. But what we really wanted for interpreters was people who could engage with the family on a much more personal level and build up a, up a rapport. And to find those people, we, we networked extensively. It took us a, a long time. But in the end, we found four different interpreters, uh, all of them Middle Eastern origin. Um, they... A couple of them came through the Refugee Council, one because they, they worked as a volunteer for them, another because she was a neighbour of one of their workers who actually worked professionally as an interpreter. Uh, a third person applied for a job with our 
with our lead sponsor. Didn't get the job, but because they were from the Middle East, were willing to volunteer as an interpreter. A fourth gentleman who joined our team after the family had arrived lives two hours away from here, but obviously with our familiarity now with Zoom, etc., that's that's not been an issue. And and he's a Syrian. He comes from one of the cities that one of our family members come from. They all work voluntarily. We help out with expenses for their time and travel, uh, but they're they're all volunteers, and they've been hugely significant in building up the relationship with the resettlement family, much more so than I think we would have predicted when we were in the preparation stage. But if we think about it, our welcoming party at the airport was four people, two volunteers and two interpreters. They, they were 50% of the first people that the family met. During that first week here in Settle, um, the interpreters were required to be available 24 seven. And that meant that it was their phone numbers that the family had as the first port of call during that first week and for a considerable length of time afterwards. Very different to a commercial service where you would expect an interpreter to strictly interpret the words that you say and, and that the other party says. Um, with, with our kind of situation, the interpreters very quickly became involved in explaining things, both practical things and, and cultural things. Uh, they started getting queries directly from the family. The family realised that they could turn directly to the interpreters uh, rather than perhaps going through them to ask a question of one of, one of the volunteers. And we, we encouraged that development. It, it, it was great. It, it gave the family a great sense of comfort and security. Uh, and gradually WhatsApp conversations were, were pretty, pretty much daily occurrences with, with, with most of the interpreters. Unexpected in terms of our planning, but the interpreters also became a gateway to meeting other people. As I said, we don't have ethnic diversity here in Settle. We'd already established our own contacts as a support group with um, people in, in, in neighboring towns and, and conurbations uh, who were of Syri Syrian origin uh, and Arabic speakers. But the interpreters, in a sense, brought an extra dimension because they already had their own social network. Some of them already worked with people who'd been in this country for three or four years, having arrived as refugees themselves. And so they were able to act as an introduction and befriending agency in that wide, wider sense, which was really powerful. And they developed uh, friendships according to interests. So we, we have a three generation family. And for example, one of our interpreters particularly identifies with the older member of the family. Another one is a younger woman with her own children. She identifies with the younger family members with, with their children. And particularly in the case of the older one, she's become the preferred accompanier for taking the, the grandma to, to medical appointments. And that's what the grandma wants. And these are generally all incredibly positive things. But there are some caveats because that familiarity and friendship we all know can really get in the way. Perhaps when a medic wants to ask some quite personal and, and probing questions, that friendship and familiarity ca can be an inhibiting factor. Sometimes the interpreter's enthusiasm outstrips the things that the, that the group is able to, to, to offer. Um, their priorities may be a bit different to the ones that the group have decided are the priorities with the, with the family. Because the interpreter, although they're kind of volunteers, they're not part of the group, they're geographically distant, and they, they were not part of the, of the original setup. And I think sometimes having an interpreter as such a befriender can actually slow up the immersion in English. Although, to be honest, the immersion in English has been totally kiboshed by the, by the pandemic. It's, it's one of the tragedies of the pandemic, really. We've had to sometimes manage these tensions. We've, we've had examples. Um, one interpreter got really enthusiastic about the family making cheese and and possibly developing it into a sort of you know little mini home business but they didn't have the broader view they didn't sort of realize that there were there were clauses on the rental agreement for the flat that would have prohibited that they didn't realize the possible implications for universal credit they didn't realize the possible uh, Im implications for the family's big big priority which is attending their their english esol lessons so sometimes there's you, you have conflicts like that that you sometimes just have to manage but on, on the on the whole I've got to wholeheartedly say I would recommend having an interpreter or a selection of interpreters as a befriender. It, 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 it comes with added value that we was, as I say, greater than we'd anticipated in our planning. I think I do have a couple of minutes just to share with you other highlights and 
please do come back with more questions about the interpreter issues that, that I've just sort of quickly, quickly mentioned. But just to share a couple of other highlights with you, because I think it, it's such a precious thing, this community sponsorship. And Jenny's already sort of talked a little bit about some of these things at the beginning. In our community, I'm, I'm thinking two years ago, there was a chap who on his 67th birthday, which fell at one of the shortest days of the year in January, he ran the Yorkshire Three Peaks. Short day, 20 miles, 5,000 feet of ascent, 67 years old. And he had a well, what he called his harem uh, of, of five accompaniers, uh, one of whom works for the refugee council. It's fantastic. Uh, and they raised a stack of money, wonderful publicity, great opportunity. We, we grabbed every opportunity we could to share about the project and to prepare the people of Settle who have been really, really welcoming. And another really touching moment, uh, we have one main bank that's open full time. And that was the bank that family and we chose for their banking and the staff in the bank became so kind of attached and affected by the extensive uh, contact they had with the family because there's a lot of hurdles at the beginning with identification and security checks and so on the the bank staff got so affected that they decided they would do their annual fundraiser for the family so it was a whole huge community event the bank matched pound for pound every pound that they raised and just having that influence on other bits of the community I, I think was really One really minute. powerful couple One of minute. highlights couple of highlights for the family um there's so many things that they I'm sure they couldn't have imagined we couldn't have imagined 15 months ago they came as four they're now five they, they had a lovely little baby boy the, this summer they're toddler their first child you know in her beautiful new school uniform going to nursery for the first time uh, the husband getting some work experience with a local painter and decorator. That was his trade previously in, in Syria. And perhaps most recent and most exciting, um, about four weeks ago, the young couple received their provisional driving licenses. They were going to have their first driving lesson tomorrow, sadly postponed, of course, for a month with lockdown. I could share so much more, but that gives you a flavour of what's been happening here in Settle. Thank you. So now we're going to play um, Lena's film. Uh, Louise, over to you. Lena Lassley, I'm from Syria. I've lived in the UK for a year and a half. I have three boys. The twins are 11 and the youngest one is six. I came from Jordan. When the UN told us if we'd like to go to the UK, we couldn't hesitate. We decided to come to England for the safety of our children. It was a great chance to rebuild our new life. When we arrived at the airport, the sponsors were waiting to welcome us. We didn't know a lot about them. We had just known their names and they are from the community sponsorship. Our house wasn't missing anything. And they had written a timetable to make everything easy because we had to do a lot of things like going to job center, bank, schools, doctor, shops, church. Where can I meet my group? We have finally got some stability in Sutton, our new home. At first, life was difficult. We struggled with finding some special food, but then everything turned easy. Just a few shops that are a little bit away from our house. My twins are at secondary school and they are happy and settled at their new school. And my little ones, school is two minutes away from home he likes school and he gets bored at home now they all speak english and sometimes they correct what i say my husband was an electrician in syria and jordan and now he has been learning english at the same time he is studying electric 
to get a job that he likes. He likes to walk, but he needs some help to land a good job. It's, it's really different to what we are used to. He has got a driving license for two months. I have studied English literature before at Damascus University. I couldn't finish my studying and graduate because of the war. Great chance to come here so I could achieve my aim in learning English language. I am studying level 2 at Setting College and I passed theory test for driving a first time and we will find out an instructor to start the lessons hopefully soon. Before COVID-19, I worked as a volunteer in toddler time at Sutton Salvation Army Church. We don't feel strangers. We feel that we are welcome and we are friends with the local community that presents love, pace, hope and trust. We were invited to many festivals, social and local events to get involved with, like Christmas, Bonfire Night, Pancake Day, Birthday Parties, Wedding Celebrations, Cinema, Parks, Dinner. All of that make us know more about them and about their culture. On the other hand, we tell them how our culture is and what we do in our festivals and celebrations. We learn from them and they learn from us. Compared with a family who came with us in the same plane, this family suffered a lot because, because they came as part of local authority scheme. Uh, they spent their time at home with, the, with their children and they haven't been anywhere in England. Also, they don't have English friends, which is not good. At least they won't be able to improve English without having friends. I've never forgot my family church support and how they are very kind, warm, friendly, and how they look after my children when we aren't home. A thank you is a small word to say to those people who helped us. And now we have plans for the future and we want to be able to develop our lives and to be productive like everyone else. Thank you very much. Um, that was a beautiful film and very encouraging and inspiring. Um, and the kind of um, good news story that we all really need um, at the moment. Now we're going to move into our question and answer session. Um, it's going to be run by um, Tash Nichols, who is a PhD and a researcher at the University of Birmingham. Um, she'll select some of the questions from the Q&A. Um, we're also planning, because some of you are saying, oh, we'd really like to see the other people on the call. We're planning to um, put the screen on so that you can see everybody. If you don't want to be seen, can you please turn your camera off? So we'll give you five, ten seconds to do that. Um, turn your camera off if you don't want people to see who you are. Um, and then the rest of us can get a sense of who, who's out there so it's somewhat less anonymous. And just to remind those of you who are responding to the questions, please make your response fairly short. Okay then, um, should we try and share our screens? And Tash, over to you to ask um, a question or two. Hi everybody, thank you so much for attending and thanks to all the panellists so far, it's really interesting. Um, my first question is from Terry Morin 
and I apologise in advance for any pronunciation, it's not my strong point. Um, I think this question is, you haven't specified Terry, but I think this is possibly for Jenny. Um, did you ask the groups whether any of them formalised the support for their volunteers to help them manage the stresses that you mentioned? Um, and if so, what kind of form did this take? Um, I'm not sure that we encountered any formal structures, but over time we've identified that um, you know, more and more training is being put in place for the volunteers within the groups, certainly at the early stages of when they join. I don't know if Marisol, would you like to add anything to this? Because you spoke to the volunteers. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I, I don't know if my mic is, is good, but I just want to say that uh, we have some information in our report that can be helpful. Uh, for some of the groups. And uh, there we also have some sites with some uh, other information that can be helpful for, for this kind of uh, situation. So we will share with you all, all the research that we have been producing in the last three years, which is quite ab abundant. And I'm sure that you will be able to find their information that is helpful. Otherwise, very happy if you want to contact us at the University of Birmingham. Uh, to share more information with you. Thanks, Marisol. Thanks, um, Jenny, and thanks, Terry, for your question. Moving on, we've got a question from Anna Beasley, and this is a question um, for Reset, I think. Um, so, Monica, she's asking, what is Reset's position on community sponsorship being included in the government's quota of resettlement? And will there be any push um, for community sponsorship to be additional to these numbers? So when uh, back in the first half of this year, before the lockdown, in fact, it's before that, to, uh, it was it might even have been, gosh, uh, my uh, time, time is strange these days. Last year, in fact, I think it was last summer, the government announced that when the VPRS scheme commitment was completed, it would be succeeded by a thing to be called the UK resettlement scheme, UKRS, and under that scheme, numbers of re refugees resettled in the UK through sponsorship would be additional to government targets. So that commitment had already been made and that was something that we really welcomed. We think it's uh, for a variety of reasons, it's important and, and the right thing to do. Um, as I was suggesting in earlier in my comments earlier, we're not now completely sure of the status of the commitment towards uh, UKRS. We, are hopeful that it's going to go ahead, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, some form uh, like, as we were expecting, um, in which case it would, it, would in, it would still be the case that sponsorship numbers will be additional. So, um, so I, I, hope, I, I hope it answers the question. Uh, we, we, we think that as it stands now, we would expect in the new scheme sponsorship to be additional and that's great. Thanks Monica and thank you for the question as well, Anna. Um, moving on, I've got another question from Terry. And this one's for Paul. Um, so he's asking about support. He spoke about working with interpreters um, and he's asking in his experience, they have felt exposed to some difficult stories, but without the support. Um, and he was asking what's on offer for the inter what was on offer for the interpreters in terms of support from your group. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, as, as I sort of said in my uh, presentation, we didn't in a way expect the interpreters to be as deeply involved as they were, although we were hoping that they would be befrienders. Their level of involvement has been a lot deeper than we anticipated and we didn't um, set up any particular form of support for them. Uh, two of our interpreters during the two years now that we've been working with them have had very significant personal uh, issues that have caused them significant emotional distress and in fact we found ourselves as a group giving some uh, informal support, but we've not really given any consideration or had the occasion to think about the need for structured, formalised support for the interpreters. I think it's a really good point when people are doing planning. Uh, it's one of those things, again, maybe very difficult to plan for until something crops up because you don't know what exactly what type of support you, you might need. But I think being aware of the possibilities for psychological support and maybe even being prepared to pay for that if, if needs be out of group funds would be something I would now think of that I certainly didn't think of two years ago. 
Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Terry, again, and apologies, um, apologies for guessing that wrong. Um, I've got another question for you, Paul, you're in high demand, um, from Catherine at um, Cresco Menai, I think that's Welcome Menai, um, from Wales. And she's talking about, she's got three uh, wonderful women that are part of her team and they were ready to work with the family, but they've assumed that they'll be paying for their work. And so she's asking, how do you make a distinction between the interpreting that's paid and the voluntary befriending um, when they eventually manage to welcome the family next year? <laughs> you have that wonderful social dance of what do we say, how do we manage? It, 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 it can be quite delicate. The situation with our interpreters, we, we did offer them a, a sort of honorarium on a, on a per hour basis. I mean, one of them, I think I mentioned, was a professional interpreter and we got to know her simply through a neighbour who worked for the Refugee Council. Uh, and, and we asked her, what, what do you get paid when you're working for, for the agency that you work for? And we said, well, look, we, we can meet something, you know, approaching that and she was very reluctant very very reticent and we ended up with a rather ad hoc arrangement of keeping a note of how many hours she did and from time to time making a payment that approximated the reality of course is that actually she spends a lot more time on all the casual ad hoc um, befriending activities that I was I was talking about uh, one of our other interpreters who can one of our other interpreters who came in uh, partway through the project, just joined us last January, was he has a different job altogether. He doesn't work as an interpreter and we were taking out time. He hadn't volunteered. He was recruited by a friend of a friend. And once we'd established, uh, if you like, his, his credentials, that he was able to do the job and safely, uh, we again, we offered him a, an, an honorarium, which he variably takes and doesn't take. So it's a very fudgy, loose answer, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there Catherine I'm not sure whether that's helpful to you but I think in, in a way we don't pay for the befriending and I don't think the interpreters would for a moment want us to but we do try and recompense them for some of the time and it's literally only some of the time that they spend on our, our behalf with the family. Thank you Paul and thank you Catherine for your first question and um, I've just noted you've got a follow-up question about uh, possibly reset providing some sort of framework for supervision support for the interpreters. Monica, are you happy to answer that question? Can you just clarify what, what is the question exactly? Sorry, I'll ask it again. Um, could reset provide some kind of framework for providing supervision support for the interpreters? Do you, I'm not quite sure what you mean by supervision support. Do you mean somebody to supervise the interpreting activity. I think Catherine if you want to pop um, a comment in the box but I think that is the kind of thing she's referring to please feel free to correct me Catherine. I think in a, a general um, I mean a general answer would be that um, we have some guidance and advice on interpreting uh, practices and procedures as part of our training I think the best thing, uh, I mean, I think probably the short answer is, is no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't provide supervision. Uh, that's, that's not really our role. Um, but if, uh, if you kind of could, could clarify the question so that I'm, I'm sure exactly what it is answering, I'm happy to uh, take that back to the team and see if there's anything else that we could provide. I wonder if we'll um, post that question to you uh, following the session and you can get yeah, back yeah. to Catherine on That'll that That'd be one. fine. Um, so I've got another question here. I'm not quite sure who it's for, but I'll ask it and then we'll decide who to direct that to. Um, and it's about how can people get involved with helping to get houses ready? Uh, somebody helped to furnish a home as a member of their local scout camp for a family from Syria um, who came on a different scheme and found it very fulfilling. And they wondered if there was any opportunity for them to get further involved. Um, I wonder if that would be possibly for reset. Monica, are you happy to take that question? Um, I think if I've understood the question correctly, again, I think that there's lots of different ways that people um, get in touch with uh, groups and can then participate in all stages of the, um, the welcoming and the support experience. I don't, um, I don't know how you would particularly connect people to a group in order to do a particular activity like supporting with, with furnishing a house or something like that. We could definitely help with um, connecting people with groups in their local areas. 
but then it would really be up to the group and depending on what they were doing and whether we you know whether whether they had activities that they were taking to, that they were doing at that particular time so we certainly could connect people with local groups absolutely um, but in terms of connecting people in order to do particular activities that's really something that that the group is um because the because the group uh is you know is kind of deciding what it is that they need to do at any particular time um and again it isn't something that we you know seek, seek to control or, or to kind of manage in any way i think um is it okay if I speak, Tash? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, just to say that uh, there are many different models for getting involved in community sponsorship. So, um, you know, looking across the different um, ways in which the groups have worked, you know, some have focused on running a, like a specific event and just drawing specific expertise around your or kind of, you know, voluntary time around music or baking or whatever. Um, it is quite conceivable that groups could reach out to communities um, and ask to have, you know, to run a special day where they try and gather furniture or whatever. Um, so different groups have been doing this in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be a consistent volunteer offer. And I think if groups are aware of this, then they can really tap into the interest of the local community. And um, so if there is a specific problem, and, and we've seen a bit of this under the pandemic as well. I mean, certainly where I live on next door and the local Facebook group, you have people saying all the time, uh, this is my washing machine is broken. Does anyone have a, an old one I could use and stuff like that? We could tap into some of these new mm -hmm. structures to try to um, bring into some of the, um, to the, the group, some of the resources that are needed to support families once they arrive or once they're here. Thanks, Jenny. We've just had a further comment from Nadine um, about the use of interpreters. It's more a comment than a question, so I will read it out. Um, they, she mentioned that they had issues with the family asking too much of an interpreter, and actually uh, their group took advantage of some training offered by Reset. I think it was called Befriending and Setting Boundaries, and she recommends that that's a good thing for groups to do. Um, I know Catherine was asking about supporting supervisors and their emotional needs, having dealt with the family, if, if the supervisor themselves needs any further support. So possibly that's uh, a good thing to look into for groups um, with reset. And I think on that note, we're just at 1.55 and I think we'll be taking our five minute break now. So if everybody could make sure they're back for two o'clock and we'll start at two o'clock promptly. Thank you for all your questions. I think we're starting at 2.05 actually. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So if, there's, if there are any more questions, now is your moment. Oh. Yes, um, okay. I can answer that one. I've just seen it. So. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, so Hannah Haycox is asking for further details about the areas in which people were resettled in our research and could they be classified as uh, middle class and how did this impact on the scheme and services provided? Um, yeah, <laughs> the majority of our volunteers are certainly or would certainly be de defined as middle class. I mean, 75% women, largely retired or semi-retired, uh, all but 4% were white. Um, things are changing in community sponsorship and I was on a West Midlands um, networking call last night on Zoom and um, there were a number of mosques who are pretty much ready to go just waiting on things to open um, and those are in less middle class areas. Certainly I, I mentioned one of the problems was with housing and it's the cost of housing that's been really problematic in some places. Um, you've had groups sometimes providing subsidies um, and then there's been other examples of um, local people donating housing, um, you know, or, or uh, allowing a house to be rented out at sub market rent. Um, so I think one of the challenges as community sponsorship moves forward um, is to think about well, how we cover the cost of housing in middle class areas, but also the importance of community sponsorship being less niche. And I do think this will change, you know, if we get the chance to roll it out a bit further, the, um, certainly from the meeting I was at last night, 
the um, you know the interest is there and it really seems to be growing. I don't know if Monica wants to add anything to that and maybe Paul could tell us about his experiences of dealing with high housing costs. Housing is definitely one of the biggest issues that groups face and it's something that we have looked at from a variety of different angles but it is quite tricky. What we would say is that we have found consistently in our experience at Reset is that groups, um, sponsorship groups for, for a variety of different reasons have on average good success in approaching private landlords, um, which, which can be really helpful in terms of securing a house in the first place. The other problem we do have though, and this touches on the middle class question, or the kind of, you know, whether you're primarily settling people in, in well-to-do areas with relatively expensive housing. There is a real uh, problem with secondary resettlement that we're having. So when uh, groups arrive, so when, so when a family arrives, the group has to uh, secure housing for that family for the first two years. And what we are finding is that we have, it, we have situations where uh, groups and families get to the end of that two years and then the family can't afford to stay in that area. And that's really a problem because they've spent two years embedding in that community, integrating in that community. And then at the end of that two years, they have to get up and they have to move again. And that's really problematic from all kinds of angles. So that's not something that, uh, you know, anyone has kind of found a solution for yet. But it is it's absolutely one of the biggest problems there is. And I think, like Jenny said, there are lots of groups who uh, we know pay uh, top up, rental top up, which is, really an understandable thing to do and I, you know I fully understand why why that happens but it can perpetuate that kind of the, the risk or the problem of, of secondary resettlement when you get to the end of that period uh, and the family are solely responsible for paying for their housing and they can't afford to stay in that area so there's I mean there's different ways you can manage it but it is absolutely it's a problem. That's great. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Jenny. So I think now we will move into our five minute break and we'll see everybody back at 2.05. And just to note, we have had some comments about making local links and that kind of thing, you know, with not being able to see everybody. And um, we have had some comments in the box. So we will address that afterwards um, and, and try and work out. Oh, I think um, our time, excuse me, <coughs> we are, we have, um, we're back. It's five past, our enormous five minute break is over already. And it's time to go into the second panel. Um, so I'm just gonna very briefly introduce the panelists for our, uh, our second part of the event. Uh, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, um, Jenny McCaughey from uh, the community sponsorship group of Whitehead in Northern Ireland. We have Ala Katab, who founded Bermondsey Welcomes Refugees in Southwark and is also a community sponsorship ambassador. Um, our third panelist is Leslie Cox from a community sponsorship group in Penarth, Wales. Um, so we are moving around the United Kingdom on our event. And um, our last participant is Hani Halanoir, uh, sponsored by a community uh, sponsorship group in the UK. So exactly as we did in our last um, panel. We're going to start with Jenny and we are going to move directly through the speakers. You've got 10 minutes each with a, a one minute uh, warning from Sarah. Sarah, sorry. Um, and then you'll be cut off, unfortunately. Uh, and then we can have our questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Jenny. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. I'm not sure if you got me up on screen yet, but yes, thank you. Um, I've been asked specifically to talk about community involvement um, in community sponsorship, how you get your larger community involved and supportive. Our family arrived in September 2019. Our background is probably very similar to Paul's. We are a small town. It's a small town about 15 miles north of Belfast. The difference probably is that we are between two larger towns, Carrickfergus and Larne, both of which have a significant paramilitary presence, which I suspect Paul doesn't have in Yorkshire. Um, Northern Ireland historically has had much less immigration. There are fewer asylum seekers, fewer refugees as a whole, 
a lot of the ones who are here have really ended up here by mistake. They didn't intend to come to Northern Ireland. Um, we also tend to be a largely much whiter society. However, our town has been a more liberal and open community with a very active community involvement and has been supportive of appeals for refugees over the years. There have been no previous families in, um, settled under the community sponsorship scheme in Northern Ireland at all. We were the first, um, though there had been about 2,000 refugees under the VPRS. The VPRS scheme here was a very well organised scheme um, with a welcome centre. All uh, refugees under that scheme had key workers supplied and so it was well, well organised. In our particular area, though, no families have been settled, largely because of the concern of paramilitary intimidation. But we had a group that was keen to try. Um, we decided to have a public meeting, which we had in April 2018. Shortly before that, at the time we were publicising it, we had somebody from outside our own community who was allied to British First, who leafleted every single house in the town with a leaflet which was terribly Islamophobic um, and was bordering on hate crime. Um, but we were keen to go ahead. So we had our meeting in the local community centre. We expected about 50 people to turn up and we had 120 turned up. Um, people couldn't actually get into the room. Quite a number were from outside the town um, and were coming specifically to protest about what we were doing. There were comments about being afraid of Muslims coming into the area, concentrating on that we should be concentrating on our own homeless, that there were enough people homeless in Northern Ireland without any others being brought in. There were comments about dilution of Christian values. Um, we were told we hadn't asked permission to run this scheme. Um, so there was a fair amount of antagonism, but there was also a lot of support. Um, how did we counter that? One, one of the comments, or one of the attacks we took was looking at the British tradition of supporting refugees, that Britain has always supported refugees, and that is a British thing to do. We were also helped, I think, a lot by the presence of some of our local clergy who were very supportive, who pointed out in no uncertain terms that what we were doing was actually supporting Christian values and those who were against this were not supporting Christian values. Um, most of the people who were involved in our group had also been involved in other groups in the town supporting those in need. I help with our local food bank. Um, we also suggested that if anybody was homeless in the town, we were very happy to help them. Um, we did have one person there who said he was homeless. I was told by several people the next day, the only reason he was homeless was because his wife had kicked him out for his own reasonable behavior and he moved in with his father. So we didn't get too worried about him. After the meeting, we obviously had a fair bit of soul searching. Should we go ahead with this degree of antagonism? Should we go ahead? Um, we came to the conclusion though, that if we said, no, if not here, then where? If we don't do this, if we can't say that we will run this, where is going to be safe for this family? We also had a lot of people who were quietly supportive, but didn't want to speak up in a public meeting. Um, we had comments like, I'd rather live beside a refugee family than that lot, which was, I think, again, supportive. We talked to some of our local politicians, particularly those who might have links on the paramilitary side um, and community leaders to check if there really was a lot of uh, opposition. And we were told it wasn't. It was more individuals. So we kept going, um, but probably in a slightly more low key way. We used Facebook a lot as, as a way of communication, but we were fairly careful to accept only those who are going to be supportive on our Facebook page. And I think that is important to get rid of the trolley, get rid of people who are going to make negative comments. I think it was also, we had quite a long delay before we had a family placed with us, which was largely because we didn't have a government at the time and couldn't actually make any decisions. 
Um, but in retrospect, that was probably helpful because a lot of the fuss had settled down and there really wasn't very much. Um, so then how did we introduce the family into the situation? We were helped, I think, by the fact that we had a very photogenic family. They're absolutely gorgeous. There's three young girls and they are beautiful and you couldn't help but fall in love with them. Um, and that, I think, helped. We were very careful to discuss with neighbours in advance who was coming. Um, and we discussed with other people we knew in the street just to keep in touch with us, let us know what was happening. Um, we walked around the town with the family a lot at the beginning so that they were seen, that they were out, they were visible, and they were visible with us as support. And similarly, walking to the school and inviting them, to, um, introducing them to parents, that kind of thing. Um, the factors that I helped, that have helped, I think, the fact we actually are a small community helps um, because people are supportive. They see them as our family now. Um, I think also the fact that our family was willing to become involved, and I think that's one of the supports or one of the strengths of community sponsorship, that families also want to get involved and um, want to get to know the community. Um, so they have got things like get involved in the local carol service, being involved in school activities, that has helped. And we've had no issues once the family arrived. They have been overwhelmingly welcomed. Like I think every other family during lockdown, this was a very difficult time for them. Um, and I think that is one of the issues in a small community where they don't have easy contact with other people who are Syrian, who speak their language um, and they can't travel so much. Um, but we have now set up an ESOL class in the town. And so we have other uh, families coming from out with our own community. Uh, to get involved in that, and that's provided a huge amount of support. Um, our father's, the father and the family has got involved in a local community farm, and he's really enjoying that, um, and is just getting out into the fresh air has been very helpful for him, I think, too. They, again, have had a new baby, so we've um, got a family now of four, four little girls, um, and the amount of support and generosity when the new baby arrived was also incredible. So I think what I would say is it helps to get to know your own community. It helps to get local leaders on your side, get people who will stand up alongside you and say, this is a good scheme. Um, I think it helps to get strong support for your family whenever they arrive, be visible with them, be out with them, be, let them be seen around the community. One minute. Uh, fine, and I'll try and, and to try and get them involved in the community. Let them feel that they're important in the community, that they feel part of your community, I think also helps. So the more people they get to know in the town, I think that helped. I'm very happy to take questions, but I'm happy equally to leave it there. So I'll finish on time. Thank you. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end. So we'll move over to Alan now, please. Um, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny, for, um, uh, for your nice talk. Um, first of all, thank you for the organizer for inviting me over. Thanks for whoever who tuned in today with this sunny day. Actually, the sun is hitting me here in London. I'm not sure about Birmingham and other parts of, of the country. I'll be talking in the coming 10 minutes about um, actually about my story, my personal experience in the community sponsorship scheme, um, mainly about uh, my role, about, as, uh, about um, on being an ambassador to the community sponsorship scheme with Citizens UK Sponsor Refugees. Um, till the point when I founded Permanency Welcomes Refugees, that was a year um, and a few months ago. My name is Ala Khattab. Um, I am originally, I'm from Syria. I came to the country as a, um, as a student, as a scholar, to do international development um, um, master degree um, in the Department of Social Science in the University of Birmingham. And here we go again, I'm, uh, I'm in the same department, but this time sharing some insights and experiences. Um, few weeks after I arrived to the country, I was put in touch with someone who's called Rob McKenzie, 
uh, who's with us today, who's um, a local team member in a community group in Devon, Ottery St. Mary, next to Exeter, who um, was um, planning at the time to organize uh, an event to talk about the refugees and to talk about Syria. So Trop en encouraged me at the time to do some talk about Syria. So I talked about the country, about the culture, about the heritage, history, uh, the Syrian humans, the kindness, the food. Um, gladly, a year after this, um, the community sponsorship group in Ottery, they welcomed Hani. Hani is with us today. So they welcomed the first family to, um, to the town. And, um, and um, hopefully Hani proved my point about the Syrian food and the Syrian culture, and uh, I'm sure he did. A few months after this, actually, I was um, professionally this time put in touch with Pickwell Foundation, which is a community sponsorship group in Georgia, um, in North Devon, uh, who were looking for an interpreter um, to support the welcomed uh, new arrived family to, to Georgia. Um, and I should say that was um, a lifetime experience for me this month that I spent there um, in terms of the emotions, the positive emotions, the experience, the interaction with the family, um, and every single part of this experience from the day when we say, welcome to the family with tears as if we know them for ages, actually. Um, I'm still carrying friendship relation with the family, with the community sponsorship till now, actually. A um, um, few um, months after this, I was selected by, luckily I was selected by Sponsor Refugees, Citizens UK, to be one of their ambassadors. Um, and um, initially the role of the ambassador is um, to travel across the country, raise the awareness about the scheme, but most importantly to answer the questions of the community groups about the practicality of establishing the group. So we were targeting actually groups who were in bid or no bid situation in a gray area, whether or not, you know, to, uh, to continue with this scheme or to establish a group or not. Um, so I managed to do um, um, a lot of successful, I, I should say, trips um, to different parts of the country. So I went to Dagenham, East London, uh, where I like close to my, where I live now. Um, to Twickenham, southwest of, um, of London, again to Midland, to Birmingham, Newman University in multi-faith, uh, sort of uh, iftar in one of the Ramadans two years ago, up north to Newcastle, and again to Exeter, sharing stories, experiences, insights, and thoughts about the scheme. Um, and I'm glad to say that most of the, these uh, groups, they became like independent groups, and most of them, I think, they, they already welcomed their family. Uh, meanwhile, I moved to London, um, so relocated from Birmingham to London, and I was based at the, at the time in Bermondsey, and I was um, pretty much jealous um, from two sponsorship groups um, around me, geographically very close. Uh, they are Pickham um, Foundation, Pickham Sponsor Refugees, and the other group, Heron Hill. So I was thinking um, why I'm in the middle between these two groups, and we, we don't have a community sponsorship group in, in Bermondsey. Um, I was by myself at the time, that was in May last year, and then it started from Twitter account saying Amber Menzi welcomes refugees group. It was only one person. Um, and I was lucky to, um, to meet um, Joe, uh, who founded the actual group with me last October. Um, and now I'm proudly saying that we are a community group of 30 members, almost 30 volunteers, who are working together to welcome refugee family. Uh, gladly, we've got our um, uh, application to the Home Office uh, principally accepted. We almost met the target of, um, uh, you know, of the 9,000K of the Home Office. And we have just a few steps to find maybe an accommodation. And uh, once the travel is lifted, hopefully we're going to welcome, welcome the family. So it's, it, for me, it's four years of experience with the scheme. It's from the early days of this scheme. And I would, I, I would describe it as a ladder that I'm, as if I'm taking the steps through this ladder from being a passive sort of um, uh, awareness spreader in the country to being more active in the scheme, establishing group, leading this group, being a volunteer, um, giving back to the country and giving back also to, to my Syrian fellows. Um, and I think this is pretty much of it. I would be more than happy to, uh, to answer all of your questions, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much um, and for keeping on time as well. Um, we're moving over to Leslie now, who's going to talk about the relevance of liaising with local authorities. We've got Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Hi. 
wondering why am I not coming out? I'm not coming on the screen for some reason. Can you hear me? Hear you very well, thank you. Are you trying to share any slides, Leslie? No. Yeah, you fine. We can see you. You can yeah. see me, okay. Go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm Leslie Cox, and I'm one of the lead coordinators for Croiso Penarth. Penarth is a commuter town, really, um, just outside Cardiff. And um, it does very much follow the demographic um, that you were talking about, mainly middle class, mainly white um, professional people. As you may have guessed, I'm retired, so I think I tick those boxes as well, though not all our group are. Um, and our journey as um, as a group started in April 2017 and our family came to us in September 2018. So they've been here just over two years um, now and we have a family of the parents and four children. No new additions since they came here. Um, since we started our process, our application things, obviously things have changed a lot. Um, there have been changes to the process, there's more access to training and support. Um, so my, our journey might be very different um, to current groups. But what I want to spend a few minutes doing now is just talking about the highs and the lows uh, of the experience of community sponsorship for me. And before I start, and I'm going to start on the lows, I have to say the highs hugely outweigh the lows. The major low that we had um, was the difficulty of working with our local authority. We were the first um, group in our area to look at community sponsorship. So for our local authority, it was probably quite a shock when we contacted them. And in fact, when we did eventually manage to speak to somebody, we were categorically told that Penarth was not a suitable place um, in which to bring a family and that we wouldn't have the skills to do it. And as, as a, the core sort of group who um, were party to that information, that was really, you know, we've been working, um, raising money, looking for a house, etc. And to be told that was absolutely, well, it was a terrible um, feeling. So we spoke to um, Citizens UK who were working with us on the application and we were just told, no, you can do it. They are wrong. Um, and they gave us the, um, the positive um, positivity that we needed to continue. But it was a long haul with the local authority. We needed to get their approval. Um, and we spent over six months in meeting after meeting after meeting, um, trying to get um, this sorted out. And this was incredibly frustrating. But what it did do was make us more determined as a group. At the heart of what we were trying to do, that there's a family in a refugee camp who could be in our town um, welcomed by us and we really want to do this and so we were very very determined and didn't let go of it. Um, we also had a house at that point um, and um, that was difficult for us because it had been very difficult to find one. Um, the cost of housing in our town is expensive, the cost of renting is very very expensive. We'd appealed to landlords, we'd done all sorts of things to try and get housing and eventually um, one of our local churches um, negotiated with us and we were able to secure um, the church house uh, for the family and they're still living in it and, and there doesn't seem to be any problem with that on an ongoing basis. But what we did feel really bad about was that having fundraised in the local community um, and done a lot of um, asking people to support us and people were very generous in doing so, that we were having to use some of that money just to keep the house with nobody in it. So that was a real low. We were quite, we made it quite public. We, you know, we did tell people this is what's happening, I'm afraid. Um, but we didn't want to let go of the house because we didn't think we'd be able to find anything else. But losing that money, that hard earned money uh, was very difficult. Um, my next low was in the bank. Sadly, I didn't have the positive bank experience that we heard about earlier. Uh, we had negotiated with bank staff um, about 
um, the family being able to set up an account as soon as they came. That was necessary so that the benefits could be play, paid into it. And um, we'd arranged to go in. I double checked. I happened to be the person taking um, the parents in on a particular day. And I had a phone call shortly due before we were due there saying, sorry, it's not possible. They cannot come to our bank. This is very strange. Um, and I checked with some other groups who use the same um, branch, same bank, um, and they hadn't had any problems. And basically, it tied down to the, came down to the fact that it was one employee who didn't want them to have an account in the town, which was very unpleasant. Fortunately, the family didn't know about it, but for us, that wasn't a very good or positive start. But I have to say, other banks in the town were very positive and bent over backwards to be helpful. Um, but for the, from the sponsorship group, that was that was quite a difficult thing. And we did challenge it and we did have a huge apology from the bank manager. Um, it was the one employee. Within a couple of weeks of the family being um, in the town, a local blogger wrote a particularly nasty piece of um, a nasty piece about the family, which included many lies. It um, focused on the trainers they were wearing and how much they must have cost. In fact, they'd been given and lots of things like that. And he'd also pictured the family walking through the town without them knowing. Um, and fortunately, we think we were successful in keeping this um, away from the family. They didn't know that, that uh, this had happened, but it felt really, really negative. On the back of that, we had a huge number of supportive comments. But on that same day, and I will never forget that day, um, when the children got off the school bus, one of them ran across the road and got knocked over. So it was a really, really difficult day. She, she did break her arm, um, but was fine. Um, so that, that was definitely a low point. And another um, difficult area was trying to find employment. Obviously, there was the ESOL need to learn the language. Um, the father that came had been working up until the time he came to the UK. He's a plumber. Um, of many years experience um, and I was the person who did most of his um, job centre visits with him and initially um, it was just form filling and that sort of thing and I have to say the job centre staff bent over backwards to be helpful. It was their first experience um, of somebody coming with a scheme and they were really um, as helpful as they could be. But after a while, uh, once we got into the second year, the dad wanted to look for some work. And really, we went to meeting after meeting. Um, we had lots of promises, um, but nothing happened. And that was really quite difficult. I felt really almost responsible taking him to those meetings and nothing came out of them. So they're the lows, but I have to say they're contradicted by the high points. From the very beginning, the whole experience of community uh, sponsorship has been very positive to me. I've made loads of new friends in my community, probably people I wouldn't have met before. Um, and we all had a sort of common goal. And a number of years down the line, we're still friends. And, and that's a really positive thing to come out of the whole um, experience of doing this together. Um, we also met, we discovered we had local Syrian people, either in Cardiff or even in our town. And it was great to meet them and to share their expertise before our family came. What was also great was the support of so many individuals in the town. Churches supported us, other groups, lots of individuals. And they were generous in terms of their time. They were generous in terms of their giving of money and of things, particularly when we were furnishing the house. We only had to say, oh, we need this. And we, we had um, lots of offers and lots of people came to help. So the way that it drew lots of people at different times to come and share their skills with us. I can remember the real thrill when we secured a property. We'd been looking for months, really, and we just had dead ends right, left and centre. But within our group, we had somebody who was a very skillful negotiator. And this is one of the things I would say about working as a group. You get together, you don't know what everybody's skills are, but um, when you need something done, if you ask, very often we have somebody with just that skill and we have somebody who's very good at negotiation, who negotiated with the church, who weren't being difficult, but thought a voluntary group wouldn't be able to afford the house. 
Um, and I can remember the real excitement. I was out walking when I had a phone call to say that she'd secured the property. That was a real high for me. Meeting the family for the first time was great. Um, but sharing with their everyday um, successes, the guy passing his driving test, um, successfully applying for things, even I can remember laughing, working in the pushchair, trying to get that up, that which was difficult. Being one of mums, a dad um, gave a number of us the role of honorary mums because we looked after them. Um, I have to say that for me, the experience of community sponsorship has been very, very positive and something that I would encourage any group to consider seriously. It's been a real privilege to get to know and to support the family in the ways that I've been able to do. And I feel that personally, I have got far more out of it than I have given, not something that I expected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Right, we're going to turn to our last speaker, Hani Halanoir. Halanoir, sorry, Hani. Over to you. Hello. Oh, thank you very much for letting me speak. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much. And nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Hani Arnold. I'm from Syria. I live here three years now. And uh, you saw you saw me last last time i have my baby mary she's uh, she's now two years and nor now she's in uh, no she's uh, in a school yes. in year three and abdul rahman is afternoon in year in year two in the school and they are very lovely uh, very lovely school and very good for school and uh, uh, news for mary she's going in two months time to school my last baby. She's called Mary and she's asleep now. And for me, for news for me, I'm a, a painting and decorator. I have little van now and I can do work for everything, every hard work I can do it. And uh, gardener as well. I have a van, I write in my van Abide and this is my card. Painting, decorator, and gardener, and and I have a trailer for for to do the garden stuff or something. And um, I need to let you know if 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 you need any help, I can do for any for any Syrian family or English family need need help. I really need to do any help for if far away, fine. I can drive. I'm very good at driver actually, and. Uh, 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 you can call me in, in my number any help you need to. Uh, and I'm ready for any question uh, for, for me. Yeah. Th th thank you very much. And uh, what I need to think about that. Yeah. Thank you, Hani. That's no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Right, I'm going to hand over to Tap again, um, who is going to run our Q&A session. Um, so please type up your questions into the Q&A box and um, Tash will get started. Over to you, Tash. Hey, everybody. Thank you again for all the panellists. It was really interesting to hear all of your stories. And I think um, we'll start with a question for you, Jenny. Uh, Jenny from Ireland, that is. Um, and it's about how have you gone about helping your family members to find work? Uh, well, I think that is a problem, isn't it? Because you can't really find work until you've got a reasonable level of English. Um, at least it's very difficult to find work unless you've got a reasonable level of English. Um, our family arrived just over a year ago and we're, we're doing reasonably well. Um, we're very fortunate in our time. We have an Arab speak, Arabic speaker who is also a trained ESOL teacher who is doing one-to-one -one, uh, teaching with them. And they were progressing reasonably well until lockdown. Um, and I think effectively for all families, they have probably lost about six months um learning english we've restarted the classes and that's going well but 
finding work is going to be difficult until he can learn or can speak enough English for training. Um, he's applied for his provisional driving license. As I say he's doing voluntary work on a farm, which I think he's really enjoying. But to get paid work is more difficult. Our father, they're both skilled bakers and skilled cooks. So we actually have a scheme where um, people within the group or friends of people within the group will put in orders for baklava um, and he will make it and sell it to us. But that's kind of all slightly quiet and not quite under the counter, but we're not making too much of that. Hopefully he will be able to get into some kind of baking role, but as yet we haven't been able to crack that one. Thank you, Jenny. That's really helpful. Um, we've had a comment from Lena, one of our panellists from earlier in the afternoon, um, and she mentioned how hard it was to understand the, the universal credit system. Um, we've also had a question about how has your group managed dealing with universal credit and have you had any support from your local council doing that? Um, I wonder if we could go to Leslie. Are you happy to talk about, talk about that, Leslie? Okay. Well, initially, it wasn't universal credit that we were looking at, I think because of the number of children in Wales, um, we were looking at the benefits prior to universal credit. Um, however, what I, what I didn't have a chance to say is we were very lucky that our dad has managed to get a job and a permanent job. And he volunteered, well not volunteered, but he put himself forward at, at the start of the pandemic to be a cleaner in the hospital. Loved it, even though he's a plumber, loved it and has now got a permanent job there. But when he actually got that first role, we had to, he had then to move across to universal credit. And we, we had a very friendly um, job centre guy who gave us the heads up about it, but we managed as individuals to support him in that way. So we didn't have to do that from the beginning. And so I'm not sure if really it's answered the question, but for us, that wasn't an issue. Do you have anything to add, Jenny, to that to that answer about your experiences? A universal credit is a nightmare. And it's a, let's face it, it's a nightmare for people who live in Britain, who've grown up here, um, and it's a nightmare for everybody. I think the biggest issue is the length of time it actually takes to get universal credit approved. And I think it probably took nearly seven weeks for our family to get universal credit set up. So obviously we were supporting them for that time. I have to say our local job centre was very helpful. Um, they did try to, to steer us through it. And again, it was a situation where they had never had a family coming in like this before. So they had no experience, but they did their best. Um, I find them personally quite helpful. Um, but universal credit is just crap for everybody. Thanks, Jenny. I think that's a very common problem for um, not just families, for everybody at the moment. Um, thank you for your answers. Um, we've got a question for Hanny, if you're ready for a question. Um, and somebody's asked, how do you think your experience could have been improved coming, coming to the UK as part of community sponsorship? Oh, uh, do you mean uh, on, uh, uh, do you mean for uh, the job centre? Uh, if, if the job center, I have same problem because job center, sometimes I don't understand them uh, what exactly mean about money coming in or how much money go out. Or sometimes I have help with me. Other Syrian man, he's work with me uh, in two months time from now, but he don't know how, how can they, he pay tax actually, but, but he don't know how much money is for the job center and how much money for him and how much money for, for the tax. And if he working, is some money go out from his account. We don't understand everything about this thing. And I try from three years time to understand. Uh, I don't understand. And then make change in job center from something to other thing. What, what you're talking about? Universal credit. Universal credit. And same problem for for me uh, now. Sorry, can Thanks. can I hear can Thanks. I hear the question again? Of or... course you can. So uh, somebody's just asked, how do you think that your experience coming coming to the UK as part of community sponsorship, how could that have been improved in any way? 
how could it have been better is there anything that what you know is there anything that your group understand. could have done better or is there anything that uh, is there any more support you could have been offered to help you when oh, you first oh, came over oh yes is better better thing for for uh, Syrian people come here is better thing to find w very quick uh, uh, work for him and better thing uh, has big problem for Syrian people need to work and doesn't like stay home with no work and uh, the, the language if they are find work for him for, for uh, work work help him 60 percent to be good language and I done same the, I leave I leave my table in my house some teacher coming to, to give me lesson English I leave that. I have three months only for lesson English uh, with help, but I have I, I have my language from work is better for me. I start moving yeah, that's that's m much better to to to, to do uh, someone to help him, uh, like uh, I am painting, like painting man to help me to do what is brush mean in English roller is uh, paint. This was all what I need because this is my job. And I'm very happy for my work and on stay home. With just language, language, language. And better for. Thank you, Hani. Actually, no. you, uh, you, you, what you've just spoken about leads very nicely onto a question um, from Catherine, I think, again. Um, she talks about having Syrian friends that have the skills to start a business like yours, um, painting, decorating, doing carpentry. And she wants to know how you started your business. Could you talk us through how you went about setting up your business, getting your van, that kind of thing? Yes, I'm, I'm starting actually business with, uh, with, with people from Abide in Ottery St. Mary. I paint for him his house and they are text have a touch with other man called uh, Aston, Aston Painting and Decorate as well. Uh, he helped me for two, three months to work with him. He tell me what brush mean, what's paint mean, what is, what is wall, ceiling, everything for two months. And then I leave him and then I build myself for, in, in a white people, I start with him and then they are say my, my work is good. And then, like, have advice as man, he speak with other man. I have house and another house and other house. And people uh, from Abide making uh, 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 advice in newspaper. newspaper for me for one year. For everybody seeing Autry, I'm painting and decorator. And then this advice helped me more. Thank you, Hani. I think we've actually, uh, whilst you're talking, I think we've actually got a video of yours to play. So maybe we'll play this now and then we'll come back to the question and answer. Louise, okay. are you happy to play that video for us? Yeah, one moment. Thank you very this much. And thanks, video. Hani. No problem. This is, this is what I thought um, I did. Notary St. Mary, something extraordinary has happened. Hani Anut and his family are here thanks to a group of friends and neighbours who wanted to make a difference. I think I just remember feeling um, how desperate must these people be to flee everything that's familiar to them and to take such a risk. Anna Roderick set up a group which raised thousands to provide the Anuts with a house and other support. The government promised to bring 20,000 Syrian refugees to the UK by 2020. Most will be settled by councils, but 45 families have come, like the Anuts, as part of the community sponsorship scheme. A lot of people have donated stuff that the family have needed since they have arrived, but other people have given a lot of time and befriending the family and supporting them. So lots of people have just got involved in different ways according to what they felt comfortable with and what their skills are. There have been times where you just think, oh, you know, what have I taken on? But they pass and you just have to keep on keeping on. And the rewards are, you know, the rewards are huge. Before
Before arriving in Devon, the family had been refugees in Jordan, where life was a desperate struggle. I have just three mattresses for all my family and one bedroom. And sitting there in this mattress, I sleep in this mattress. And I'm very, very happy. And I, I talk, thank you, my God, because I have like this house. Hani told me what happened to the family before they reached safety. It's a brutal and sad story. These are the last pictures of Hani and Amni's bombed out home in Syria. One day I'm asleep down the stairs. Uh, is an uh, airplane bomb in my house. I think I am dying. Two weeks I'm not listening, not very good listening. You can't hear? Yeah, no. Two weeks. Two weeks. Of the noise. Yeah, move very, yeah. His daughter Noor, who was then a baby, was in the house. I have uh, Noor. He's six, she's six months. I think Noor is dying. I'm wake up, wake up, wake up. No, is uh, uh, no, no wake up, uh, no cry, never. Uh, I think die. No, was alive, but the family had lost their house and had to survive in a country which was being destroyed. Honey was trying to find clothes for his family when he was seized at gunpoint by masked men who held him for a month and tortured him. Life for yes. And uh, 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 leave me in car boat. In the boot of the car. In the boot of the car. Right. I don't know. I am where. I don't know where it's go. Hit me every day. Every day, two hours. They beat you. Yeah. Mm. Every day, two hours. Uh, I have no problem for them mm. in my hand. Mm. What did they do to your uh, hand? Because it's half cable. Cable electricity. Right. Yeah, from here. And go to out. They they hung you, they pulled you up. They yeah. hung you up by your wrists. Yeah, the they... up, one hour. When I'm uh, and head. And beat you? Yeah. Uh, another cable. I think when I'm died is better. I'm speak for my God, please my God. Died is better for me. Hani's captors threatened to murder him, but he was released as suddenly as he'd been abducted. The family fled to Jordan, where Amni gave birth to a son, Mohammed. Hani was trying to arrange care for him, when he got a phone call from the hospital. I'm sorry, your son has died. Um, take my son and go to down air. <clears throat> After five years in Jordan, the family was selected to come to the UK as refugees. In Ottery St. Mary, the volunteers had received Home Office approval and they were sent some details about the Anuts. I think when I sat down and read the, the file, uh, that was the time when it really struck home because it, it put a face uh, to, to an idea, I suppose. And then suddenly I was looking at their photographs and reading about their case history and thinking, oh, this is it, this is, this is the family that are gonna come to us. Within days, Nor was attending the local primary school, where the teachers worked with Anna's group to help the family settle in. They've taken the family under their wing. Um, for example, have taken Nor and her family I think, to the beach, um, things like that. I think it's a personal touch, and I think that's what's helped the family really, really settle in. Whenever they've got a problem, they go to Anna. Anna communicates it to us, and it's it's just felt really, really personal. Although only a small minority of Syrian refugees are settled by community sponsorship schemes, the numbers are growing. George Wilkinson is involved in setting up a new project in Morton Hampstead. He's come to get some advice from Anna. And what has been incredibly encouraging is the way people have stepped up and said, yes, and I would like to help. And 
count me in. I was told by Anna that it would be very good for our community. It's not just for the Syrian family. There is a cohesion that you get in your community. Audrey St. Mary is celebrating the family's first year in the town. Salam alaikum, welcome. It's lovely to see you all here. I can't believe that a year has gone by and here we are. So today it's really just about pausing to uh, celebrate where we've come from and to reflect on the last year and uh, hopefully have a good time together. It's been a lot of hard work. We've had ups and downs. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, people have worked well together. Uh, I have big thank you there. So Audrey Santanay is my family now. Thank you so much. On their journey to Devon, Hanny and Amni lost a son and suffered abuse and hardship. A year after arriving, they're celebrating the birth of their daughter Mary and dreaming of a better future. Hope to see her very very good lady here and looking for learning and university sometimes here when i'm asleep i think i'm in syria when i wake up i'm see oh my house i'm seeing this year i am here thank you my god like this every day I'm free here. Thanks, Hani, for sharing that video, and thanks, Louise, for putting it on the screen. And um, we'll just return to the questions now. Um, and we've got a question for Ala asking if you had any advice uh, that you could give to anybody who is thinking about starting a community sponsorship group. Yeah, my initial answer is why not? Um, if you've got the motive and the driver and um, a bit of commitment as well, this is also important. So this is what, um, what all it takes actually to, to start the group. And once you start thinking about the group, you will find a lot of support around you. Um, we've got two good organizations to approach actually, Sponsor Refugee Citizens UK and Reset who got uh, for every maybe enthusiast for the community sponsorship, they got unlimited support to, to provide. It's, I mean, um, my group started with, um, with just Twitter account and uh, with this support, um, we're now 30 volunteers actually. Um, and I can't believe that I'm at this stage now. Thank you, Ala. Does anybody have any more questions for any of our panelists? have a final check of the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much for your questions, everybody. I, I did have one question, and apologies, I've joined by the wrong link, so I can't access Q&A. I put it in the chat. Uh, but it was a question for Leslie. No, that, that's fine. You can you can go ahead. We've got about four minutes left, so if it's a quick question. Sure, it was, it was just about on the local, yeah, it was just on the uh, local authority, you know, it's a, one of your more negative experiences was about local authority. So now I was just interested to say a little bit more about who within the local authority that was, whether it was elected representatives, whether it was officers, local authority, and whether it made a difference engaging with other nearby, whether the city council had advice and more experience or anything. Thank you. It was mainly the people linked to education. It was the um, officer who was um, linking with the other VPRS scheme um, families in the, in the area. And it was, it was generally an unwillingness to engage with us um, and a denial of the fact that, that we had tried. Um, it, was, it was resolved eventually because there were two groups then. They, they then joined with the Cardiff group and it was the same group of people. Citizens UK supported us through it, but there were some very difficult meetings. Our MP um, got involved as well. And so it all got very political and difficult, um, but, but we tried to stay patient and positive and non-confrontational. Um, so eventually we were able to sort it out, but behind the scenes, it was quite political. I'm not sure if that Thank answers you. your question. Uh, 
Right. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. It's um, Jenny back here again. Uh, I just we've come to the end of the event now, and I wanted to thank the speakers, so many people who've spent their time talking about community sponsorship um, this afternoon, just, uh, you know, re-emphasizes the level of commitment to the scheme. Uh, lots of really moving material there. Thank you, Hani, for sharing that video, uh, which reminds us why community sponsorship is so important. Uh, and thanks to others for the inspiration as well. Um, to finish, I just need to remind you that you, um, you'll be asked to evaluate today's activity. Um, so please uh, make sure you can see there's a QR code, there's a, a, a URL there, but I think there was a plan also to send it out to people who had registered as well. Um, so it's helpful if you can um, give us a bit of feedback on it so we know um, for future reference how to run these events. It's our first time doing it um, virtually. Um, so, you know, we, we need to learn. Um, and if you have any further questions, please do get in touch. Um, we can pass those questions on. And please do look at um, the community sponsorship um, evaluation materials. And if there's any questions you have in the future about maybe experiences from other groups, just do feel free to get in touch. Um, big thanks to both Marisol and um, Natasha, who together came up with the idea for this um, activity and um, organized it all. And to Louise for running the technology. I am so glad, Louise, that you